Hello everybody, I'm recording this today from the middle of my current installation. Um, it's set up in my home. Because of the virus, all of my shows have been canceled for this year. Um, and that got me thinking that there are a lot of things that this is causing. There are people that are losing their lives and their loved ones. Uh, there are people that are getting laid off from work. Uh, and those are really horrible effects, and they're very obvious effects. But on top of all that is going on right now, uh, we also have an issue where nobody is experiencing these cultural things. So there's a complete dearth of uh, culture, and I think that's a huge issue. So, uh, of course, there are other issues that may take precedence over this one. But as an artist, I see a, a problem where nobody's viewing art, uh, and so it gets a, there's a problem that that creates. I feel like art is good for you. It's good for you to make it. It's good for you to see it. Uh, it just depends on whether you're a creator, if you are a creative person and you feel the drive to create art. Uh, but just any person, I think it's really good for us to see art. And uh, it's not just art that we make. Um, there's a lot of research that's going on right now uh, showing that the Japanese concept of forest bathing can have a dramatic impact on your health and your well-being. Uh, just the idea that you can go into the woods and surround yourself with, this, with the beauty of nature and it actually has a physical impact on us. And so I think art does the same thing. Uh, I'm not going to debate which is uh, which has a stronger impact, but I think we make art for a reason. I think we are the way we are for a reason. And so I've actually shared what I'm doing. I've actually come up with a way to share my art with people in my community. So I've set up an installation here inside my home and I'm just going to give people the opportunity in my neighborhood to view art. So anybody can drive through here, anybody can walk up and look at this installation through the window and they don't have to have, uh, they don't have to put themselves at risk to, uh, to get exposed to a virus or anything like that to see art. So it's just, it's kind of a it's somewhere between street art and and a gallery. Uh, and I like the idea of just people being able to peer into this window at this little microcosm. And so they can see this little world through the window. And I really like the implications of that. So today we're going to be learning about an art movement called Surrealism. Surrealism is a very interesting movement. I feel like it's a, it's a very popular movement with uh, the youth of this generation. Uh, most of the younger people I know really like this, uh, like the way this movement looks aesthetically. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting ideas that go into it, and uh, we're going to dive into that today. And so I think this is a really good segue because there are elements of my work that are surrealist but not overly so um, but whenever we look at surrealism today as a movement in art uh, you can think back to what you saw in here and kind of think of some of the similarities and kind of compare that to something that a contemporary artist is doing surrealism began in the 1920s and you can see there's no end date here. Some scholars say that it ended in the 40s. Uh, however, uh, some of the major players in this movement continued to make surrealist art all the way through the 60s. Really what happened uh, was surrealism kind of faded out. It was overshadowed by several movements that became more popular. As you can see, one of the prominent features of surrealism is dreamlike imagery. So on this slide you can see someone holding a landscape in the palm of their hand and there's this 
personal thunderstorm over this one solitary person, uh, and they're surrounded by a desert. So these are, this is very symbolic. There's a reason for this dreamlike imagery. As one person is quoted saying, they're trying to resolve the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality. And that's a fancy way of stating that they're developing painting techniques that allow the unconscious to express itself. So I think it'll be worth taking the time to unpackage this idea of a subconscious. Hopefully, we all have what we would call a conscious mind. We have thoughts, we have feelings, and we're aware of those thoughts and feelings as well as the environment we're in and many other things. We make deliberate decisions about things. Um, if I want to walk from one side of the room to the other, uh, I consciously engage in that. I make that decision and then I do it. However, we have more to us in our mind than just what we're consciously aware of. So if you think about it, uh, when you go to bed and you have a dream, most of us can't decide where the dream's going to take place or whether or not we're going to be chased by terrifying clowns all night. Things happen in our dreams that we seem to have no control over. Now, if you take a moment to think about that, you or some part of you still has to create that dream. So there's a part of you that you're not in control of that is creating these false worlds and these false scenarios for you at night while you're asleep and you have no control over them in most circumstances. So there's this part of you that you can't really access. And so some of you are getting to that age where you're going to be old enough to drive really soon. And there are some of you who know how a car works and there are others of you that you just know that when you get in your car, you turn the key and then you can go. Um, and, and you may not know anything about the motor or how it works or what's underneath the hood that actually makes all that happen. Okay, and our mind's really similar to that. The really cool thing about surrealism is that these artists are trying to explore the subconscious. They're trying to find a way to tap into that part of yourself that you really don't know anything about. And they have a really clever device for doing that. And so, like many other art movements, surrealism didn't start as a visual art movement. So most movements start on the literary front. You end up having what we call a zeitgeist. So the world begins to feel a certain way overall, and that feeling begins to influence people. And usually the first artists to start uh, a style are the writers. And so surrealist writers began trying to capture glimpses from their subconscious by writing works uh, the very first words that would pop into their heads, they would just write it down on paper in the order that it popped into their head. And so they would get these meaningless uh, or seemingly meaningless phrases. We have the same kind of thing going on with visual art. So as this movement migrated to visual art, we have these artists either writing down the first things that pop in their head and then they painstakingly paint it to look realistic, or we have them, you know, making really quick free drawings where they just start drawing whatever comes out of them. And much like a dream, they're not deliberately thinking ahead of time of what they're going to say or what they're going to write. They're just taking whatever flows from their subconscious, and then they're taking that information and painting it, like I said, to almost look photorealistic. So that's where we get these dreamlike look from which really lends itself to what they're trying to do. 
Max Ernst is the first artist that we're going to cover from this movement. Ernst was interested in art that was made by people who were insane. He would actually go to insane asylums when he was younger just to view their art. He was also a pioneer in Dada, and so he went from this idea that life was meaningless and things happened for no reason at all, and and the Dada movement, their goal was to make art that was meaningless so that it would convey and accurately depict life or how they felt about life. But now he's done a complete 180. He's turned and headed the complete opposite direction. So now he's doing surrealism where there is a super deep meaning. So he went from the meaningless to the incredibly deep and meaningful. So now he's looking, digging down inside himself to explore this undiscovered territory, if you will. Let's take a moment to unpackage this work of art by Ernst. Because I think this will allow us to get to the very heart, the soul and center of surrealism. Um, because one of the really cool things about surrealism is that you are just letting your subconscious pour out. And in theory, that shouldn't make any sense. If you just say whatever randomly pops into your head and write that down, it by all rights, it shouldn't make any sense. It should be meaningless. Okay? But one of the really cool things about surrealism is that I think these artists are really able to tap into their subconscious because what happens is they actually find meaning in these things. So if we look at this piece right here, you have what appears to be a monster made out of machinery. Okay? This, this is... Um, it may not look like it, but if you look back to uh, the 1920s when this movement is beginning, this is modern technology, okay? So to us, it looks like really old technology. It's like hoses and pipes and boilers, uh, really old machinery. But this monster is actually modern technology in his day and age, okay? And then we have this figure down here in the, on the right. And this figure, if you notice, one of her prominent features is that she doesn't have a head, okay? And so we can look at some of these elements and figure out what this artist is saying or what his subconscious is saying. So we have modern technology that's a monster. And if you look at what's going on in the time, we're looking at some world wars. Uh, world War I just ended. And... This is the first time that we've been able to wage war, uh, the whole world wage war at the same time. Uh, so technology has advanced to the point that we're able to do more damage than we ever have before. Then we take a look at the figure. The figure doesn't have a head, most likely for a reason. So this figure is is nude, um, defenseless, uh, vulnerable. There's no protection, not, not even clothing to shield this figure from this monstrosity. Uh, and there, there's no head. And your head is where you come up with your ideas. That's where you come up with a plan. So... So there's no escape. This vulnerable figure uh, can't come up with a way to solve the problem. The figure's just completely vulnerable. Okay? And, uh, and so now you can take a look at maybe some of the feelings that Max Ernst was having. So he may not have known that he was so worried about this stuff, or he might have. But either way, that's what's coming out of his subconscious. So without even thinking about it, trying not to think, trying not to consciously think about uh, a composition, he's actually coming up with something that's quite meaningful. And so you've got a really interesting phenomenon here, and his fear was definitely warranted because in just a little while, uh, in just a little while, World War II is about to break out.
and we're going to come up with the atomic bomb uh, where entire cities can be wiped out all in one time. Next, uh, we have this landscape that almost looks like it's made out of coral reef or something like that. And so Max Ernst did a lot of these really bizarre dream-like landscapes. And here we have Oedipus Rex by Max Ernst. This is made in 1922. The story of Oedipus Rex is actually about a guy who grows up not knowing his mother and ends up accidentally marrying his own mother. So you can probably look at some of these clues in this painting if you want to and, and try to think about that title and maybe try to figure out some of what's going on here. But you might find it incomprehensible. Next we have René Magritte. So this is him over here on the left. Two images of Magritte, a uh, really famous surrealist painter. Um, you'll notice that the sky plays a really prominent role in his work. This particular painting, Le Chateau de Peronese, uh, is 1959. It means the castle of the Pyrenees. This is one of his most famous works. Uh, this is a painting titled This Is Not a Pipe that he did in 1929. And it's hard to say if this really fits in with the Surrealist movement. I just wanted to show you this piece because we're probably never going to be able to talk about René Magritte again. So we're going to be extra pressed for time since we have started distance learning. But even if we weren't, we still probably would not have time to touch on Magritte again. So I thought I would show you this. And so the idea is that Everything that's 2D art is just an illusion. So he's commenting on the fact that how illusory art is. So this isn't a pipe. This is an image of a pipe. So I want you to be familiar with this image. It will probably be on your quiz. And another one that will make its way to the quiz is this painting right here. This is also one of his most famous works. Uh, the Great War. And he has done several pieces where he has these figures that their face is obscured by a piece of fruit. So not a lot of rich uh, symbolism there again. So like I said, uh, this work is really full of symbolism. And one of the coolest things about it is that they're not trying necessarily to come up with this. So they might be cheating sometimes. There's no way to tell if these people followed the method and really were exploring their subconscious like they were supposed to. But I can guarantee you that, that you can try this method and it will work. Um, but were they always doing it? Who knows? So we just have to give them the benefit of the doubt. So one of the things he would do is he would uh, just make these very ironic paintings. So he would have uh, things like the sky raining umbrellas instead of rain and things like that. And finally, we're going to talk about Salvador Dali. So by far, hands down, the most famous artist in this movement, a uh, very interesting character uh, and also a really good artist. So I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, and point out his handlebars on his mustache. So uh, he, ha he, like me, he has a handlebar mustache, but his is uh, quite a bit more extreme than mine, if you'll notice. This is by far his most famous work of art, The Persistence of Memory. Most of you, if you haven't seen this painting, you have at least seen the clock that's melting over to the left. This clock and this painting has been parodied in countless uh, books and movies. Uh, it's been featured uh, in, in just all kinds of pop culture. So the, this has, is just like a part of our culture. And so I want you to know the name of this piece. It's The Persistence of Memory. And if you look down here, you got some object over here to the right that is white. Um, I'll give you a second to look at that and figure out what it is.
it's actually nothing. So uh, when I have class, uh, I can actually ask you guys questions. My most common thing is that someone tells me it's a horse. So when I ask everybody what it is and point to it, they always tell me it's a horse. And then they say, wait, wait a minute. No, it's not. It, what is that? And, and so uh, my other uh, probably right after that is uh, some people see ducks, some people see a shell. And that's one of the really amazing things about Dolly is that I feel he's being genuine. He has a way of creating these objects that are, they're just so primitive and so ingrained in our minds that, that we do see things like a horse or a, a seashell when he's just making these forms that supposedly just flow freely from his subconscious. Uh, this piece is rich with symbolism as well as with the melting clocks. You can get a lot of metaphors there about time and our interaction with it. If you'll look as well, you'll see uh, he does a lot of pieces about the beach. So he'll either have sandy compositions or he'll have uh, sand with uh, the beginnings of the ocean or sea in the background. And I think uh, part of that comes from the fact that he comes from Barcelona. So there are some really bizarre things about Dali. Um, uh, one of the things that stands out is he would actually put honey in his mustache. So, he, you know, where I take uh, mustache wax or gel and I will put my handlebars in, he actually used honey so that flies and bees and things like that would land on his face while he spoke to people. Uh, he also walked around with teens and robes that were absolutely silent. They would not speak, uh, almost like, uh, almost like attendance to an altar or something like that. Really bizarre. Uh, another note, strange notion is that he actually claimed at least to love Hitler. And I can't imagine who could really love Hitler? Uh, and I mean, it, you guys may, I hope you've gotten to this in history. If you haven't, I'm sure you will. But Hitler actually exterminated uh, 11 million people because of their ethnicity. So he killed 11 million Jewish people um, just out of racism and bigotry. And so it's really hard to imagine that he really loved Hitler. Uh, I think part of this comes from the fact that a lot of artists, especially in this time period and, and, and really throughout history, a lot of the artists of the past were uh, communist. And the reason for that is that communist, communism sounds good, really good on paper. So the idea is that everyone is equal. And that sounds really wonderful. Unfortunately, it requires, uh, when you put, when you give all your power and all your rights away to the government so that everything can be distributed equally, uh, unfortunately what happens is no one, no, no one you can elect is perfect and, and no one is completely honest. And I think a lot of people, even when they are honest and they get in that situation, they're corrupted. And so what happens again and again in every communist society is that everyone does become equal. They all become equally poor because the person in control is not honest and they're corrupt. And what happens is you have mass murders like with Hitler uh, or Mussolini or Pol Pot or Stalin or Kim Jong-il or and, and the list goes on and on and on. And so communism sounds really wonderful on paper, but unfortunately it doesn't work out that way in real life because you're, you're just depending on your rulers to be these perfect, honest people and they just aren't. Um, and so a lot of artists, you know, they're dreamers and they really would like that to work out. You actually have figures like Saddam Hussein, whose people were starving to death, but he had golden toilet paper holders in his palace. I feel like a lot of the really bizarre things that Dolly did, I mean, he may have been a bizarre person, and, and I think he was, 
but I think a lot of it was just a uh, show in order to shock people. So, uh, you know, I think part of his fame, part of his character um, was that he was so bizarre. This is another really cool piece by Dali. Uh, once again, some really rich imagery. We've got these this uh, caravan of elephants, but they have these long spindly legs like spiders. Uh, really interesting piece. Once again, uh, a sandy landscape. Finally, we have this piece here where this bridge going across the water ends up becoming negative space. So the positive space of the bridge ends up becoming negative space around these boats and the boats were formed. The positive space of these boats was formed out of the negative space of the bridge. So a really nice illusion there, a really cool piece. This is kind of a nod back to M.C. Escher and the way he uh, explored space. So in closing, I would just like to wrap things up and kind of give a summary of what we've spoken about so far. So surrealism was a movement that started in the 1920s uh, and it focused heavily on trying to explore the subconscious. This was probably fueled a lot by Sigmund Freud, who was uh, doing a lot of theorizing about the subconscious at the time. He was really popular. He's actually fallen out of vogue and, and kind of been, he's been discredited largely now. But he probably was uh, the source of a lot of this curiosity with the subconscious. But this movement ended up lasting for quite a while as far as a modern art movement goes. So you're talking about a 20-year movement. It's not bad. Cubism was only 10 years. And you get all this beautiful dreamlike imagery. And that's actually where it gets its name from. So it's surreal. It's, it's not real. It's surreal. So you have this really photorealistic looking imagery where everything looks naturalistic. It looks real to the naked eye. And, but the, the things that are happening could never be real. I'm actually wearing my Scream socks, so everybody can see that. I have a vast collection of art history socks or famous artworks. Um, I'm currently missing surrealism socks, so if anybody wants to get me any surrealism socks, uh, I will gladly take them. All right, that concludes our lesson for today. I hope everybody's staying safe. Uh, we'll have a Zoom meeting really soon. I uh, hope to see you guys then. And uh, you just take care of yourself, be careful, uh, and keep trying to get adapted to this uh, lockdown. And uh, I'll see you guys uh, on our Zoom meeting soon.